Welcome everyone to today's Be Well Lunch and Learn titled Our Sacred Vocation, Finding Meaning in Our Work. We're so excited to have David Simmons join us. He is the Director of Pastoral Care in the Department of Pastoral Services at the Hershey Medical Center campus. So welcome, David. Before I pass things off to him, I do want to remind you that these are recorded. So if you are unable to stay with us for the entire length of today's session, we will be sending a follow-up email, which will include both the recording and a copy of the slide set. Um, so expect that within the next few days or so. We also place all of our Lunch and Learn sessions on our Be Well website. So if there's any that you missed in the past that you were looking for, feel free to visit that um, on our Be Well website. Secondly, if you have any questions for David throughout today's session, feel free to place them in either the Q&A or the chat box, and we will take a look at that at the end of the session and get to as many as time allows for. So with that, David, I will pass this over to you. Thank you so much for um, being here today and presenting to us. Well, thank you very much. It's always uh, great to be a part of the, the Be Well Lunch and Learn series. Uh, I think this is my third time getting to do this. The first time way back in the dark ages when we met in person pre-pandemic. But uh, the exciting part about um, being together is uh, post-pandemic is that we can do this virtually and connect all across the system. And so it's great to be with my colleagues today and get to share a little bit about a subject that I've spent a lot of time thinking about over the course of my life. And uh, usually uh, not because I wanted to, because of life events that have occurred, events that I will kind of share a little bit about as I go along. But today we're going to talk about our work and what role it plays in our life. And I, I will tell you that today's presentation will be much less like a lecture and a little more like, like a sermon almost. I felt like this reminded me of writing a sermon, just thinking about um, what it means to think and reflect on things. And so I, I want to I, I invite you into reflective space. So if you're sitting at a desk and you, you know, you're not going to get written up for looking like you're sleeping at the desk and you just want to sit there and you put on your headphones and close your eyes and think, and reflect on work, on your work life and what it means, feel free to do that. Um, I have included uh, some a lot of visuals in here and a lot of it is uh, my own photography. Uh, my two hobbies are photography and travel, love to do both. And I'm gonna talk about how hobbies are also an extension of our work. It's, it brings a lot of meaning to us. So I thought I'd share some of that with you. And um, in, Throughout this, not only will I be sharing some of that, but I'm gonna share about three different stories with you, stories of times that made a real impact on me related to work and work life and some revelations that I got out of those stories. And I will tell you that my second story is gonna be around uh, some mental health challenges that uh, a family member of mine experienced, including uh, an attempt to take his own life. And it was, uh, so as I talk about that, I know that that could be a trigger point for some of you. And if, so when I get to that second story, you feel like, you know, I really don't need to hear a story like that. Feel free to just step away for a couple of minutes and come back. Uh, but I just wanted to, uh, to lay that out there just before I, I get started. Um, another thing I want to share is that um, as we go along, I, I want to recognize that I'm going to be talking about work from a pretty high place of privilege. And, and kind of what I mean by that is, um, I'm assuming that many of us have some agency, some self-direction around work, even though maybe we don't feel like it. We feel like, you know, maybe we don't have a lot of options in our work life. But the fact is, I think for many of us, we have a lot of choices that we've made through our life. And I recognize that there are many people in the world that don't really have a lot of choice around work as something that brings fulfillment to their life. Um, they're just, just attempting to survive. And, and I recognize there are uh, labor injustices and many things that we could be talking about. So if you were to think that my presentation is a little uh, idealistic and maybe a little naive, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that. It, at some level, I'm gonna be talking about a very uh, positive view of work but that doesn't mean that I'm not aware of, of really some, some dark places in the world related to work. Uh, but I, I hope for us, I think many of us here who are participating in this webinar today, you probably signed up because you, you do care about your work. You care about 
um, having meaningful work life. So I hope this will help you to, uh, to focus on that. So I, I want to throw up um, one of my first photos for you. This is when we were in the UAE last year at a great time in Dubai. And this quote um, or these, this data point really struck me. Most of us will spend about 100,000 hours of our lives working. I really don't even have a perspective of what, of what really 100,000 hours is, except that it's about a third of our waking adult life. So we're going to spend a lot of time working. Uh, I think many times when you ask people, you know, why do you work? Uh, we have a very simplistic and often reflective answer to that. And that is, well, I have to, I have no choice. I have to work. It's just, I got to bring in the income. I don't, I, I don't have a choice not to work. And, and I recognize that as tr that's true for me. That's true for uh, many of us that we really don't have an option but to work. But I don't want that to prevent us from leaning into work in a meaningful way to understand that work is more than just having to survive. Work can be more than just making sure we make ends meet and we survive in a very challenging world. If we're gonna spend 100,000 hours of our life working, we are, I, I would invite us to think about how we make that the most meaningful 100,000 hours that we can make it, have it contribute to the overall meaning of our lives. So with that, I'm going to start with this, my first story. So uh, my brother, he's three years younger than me. He lives in Dallas, Texas. He, um, a few years ago, he was about 45 years old. I'm a few years older than that uh, than he was at the time. Um, and so I remember him constantly telling me that he was working on a, a strategic plan to retire at age 62. He was just determined. He was going, and this is all we talked about when he would call. He was working on this plan to be ready to retire at 62. And I remember kind of thinking, why would you want to retire? Like. I love my job. I I want to do it forever, right? And and I know he he was he's an he's an insurance adjuster at a pretty high level, so he's constantly dealing with negotiations and pressures and calculations and you know big he he deals with large sums of money and he gets a lot of pressure from his higher ups and things can go to court and you never know how it's going to turn out and he's so it's a high pressure situation for him. So it kind of made some sense. Yeah, I guess eventually he would want to leave behind a high pressure world, but I really didn't connect with that. I like, I love my job. I just want to do this the rest of my life. I hadn't even thought about retirement. That was until uh, fall of 2020. I had a two to three week period of work that must have been the hardest two to three weeks of work that I've pretty much had uh, since moving into, into healthcare chaplaincy. I mean, it was high stress. I was anxious. I couldn't sleep. You know, I had knots in my stomach, uh, worried about a lot of things. There were just a lot of things that hit me all at once. And uh, despite the fact that I truly love what I do, that was a rough couple of weeks. And I remember coming out of it thinking, oh, so this is what my brother was talking about. Like, okay, now I get why somebody would want to prepare to possibly not work one day. Uh, because I thought to myself, if I were 62 or 63, and I had several of those incidents in a row, I don't know if I would be able to survive thinking I'm not able to step away from this if, if really that was the best thing for me. So I did what I think probably many of you have done at some point, and that is I found my Empower login, you know, my Empower retirement. I... I pulled that up, I found my password, I got in, like, okay, how much money do I have? I put together a spreadsheet with all my other 401k money and I put it all together. I started running formulas and calculations and watching YouTube videos and thinking, okay, well, at 62, 63, 64, am I gonna be in a position to be able to step away if work overwhelms me? All right, so I, as I'm searching all of this, of course, I'm at the whims of the YouTube algorithm and one day this uh, interesting looking video pops up and I think it's gonna be about uh, retirement and financing your retirement. And I pull up and I see the four stages or four phases of retirement in this very interesting uh, TED talk. And I watched it and it was pretty life-changing for me and really made me rethink everything about 
work and about retirement and what work means to me. Uh, if you are within the 10 years of retiring, you need to, to find this video and you need to watch it. It's real simple. It's not complex. I'm going to actually tell you what the contents of, of the, the video were. But he talks about not financial preparation for retirement, but he talks about psychological and emotional and social preparation for retirement, something we really don't talk a lot about as a society. We talk about financing our retirement, not about how to live in retirement. And here's what he said. The first phase is the vacation phase, right? Uh, this, is, this is where you can sleep in, do what you want. No one's your boss. You can go wherever you want. You can travel. You can do whatever you want. It's like a party. It's like a, it's like a constant vacation. Now, honestly, I thought that was all of retirement. I thought, I, I can't wait to retire one day and be on a permanent vacation the rest of my life. But evidently, that's not exactly how it goes. Because the next phase, a couple of years into retirement, really can hit hard. And this is what he begins describing, is that you start to realize there was a lot of stuff that brought meaning to my life that was brought to me by my work. My work brought a lot of meaning to me, and now I've lost that structure, and therefore I'm losing significant areas of meaning in my life. So loss of routine, a loss of identity. We have heavy identity connected to what we do in our work. Loss of relationships. How many relationships do we have as a result of our work life? A sense of purpose in our work, a sense of power. And you may not feel that you have a lot of power in your work, but you probably have more than you realize. And what I began to realize as I um, thought about this is that there's so much, and this is probably the point of my whole talk, if, just give it away right at the beginning. There's so much meaning that our work brings to us that we will never notice until we lose it, until one day we're on the other side of it, we're out of that work environment, and we realize, my goodness, my work actually brought a lot of meaning to me, and I failed to see it. We'll come back to that. So there becomes so after this loss, after this grief, comes the next stage, and that is a new search for meaning. Okay, so what is the rest of my life going to mean, which leads to a reinvestment in a new purpose, which is a fancy way of saying, guess what? Most people end up going back to work. And no, I don't mean they go back and get a 40 hour a week job and, and work full time and get a salary and benefits. No, they, they reinvest in finding a place to work, whether it's to volunteer or whether it is to work a little part time job or whether it is to help their grandkids or whether it is uh, like my father in law, he retired. 20 years ago, and he never leaves the house, but somehow he managed to be the busiest guy on the block. He has all kinds of work pro uh, work projects that he's working on. But you have to have that sense of purpose. So what I finally realized is that there is no such thing as work life ending and a non-work life beginning. Is the fact is we will spend the rest of our lives if we want a sense of meaning and purpose, finding work to do. Work will always be with us. You think about those stories that you hear about someone who retired and then a year or two years later decline very quickly and pass away, right? We, we, we fear that when we think about retirement. Often it is because there's not this renewed sense of purpose, this sense that there is still work for me to do. In fact, ever since watching this video, when I walk around the hospital, I am eyeing every volunteer position in this hospital. I've already decided I'm gonna be a pet therapy volunteer. I'm gonna be, I wanna be the guy that drives the cart through the hospital. I wanna be that person that greets you. I'm, I'm gonna come back to the hospital. You're, you're gonna be like, I thought David retired last week and I still see him walking the halls. That's gonna be me. I'm gonna find a reason to come back and to volunteer and keep working because I know that work if I put it this way, we work not just because we have to, we work because we're designed to. And if we can make that shift, we'll begin to see our work differently. We'll begin to take more active control over the meaning that our work brings to us. We'll begin looking for the sense of meaning that work brings to us. So yes, if you ask people why they work, the instant reaction is because I have to. And yes, 
Most of us have to. But realize that it, that work is not a bug. It is a feature, right? It is a feature of our lives. It is not the exception. It is, it is what we're actually created to do. In fact, if you look at the many worldviews among world religions, uh, actually, unfortunately, many of us hold to what I would call the ancient Greek view, that work is a curse, that really leisure is the ultimate goal, leisure is the ultimate blessing. That the, but of course, in the ancient Greek world, only the elite could not work. They had an entire underclass of slaves and uh, low socioeconomic uh, folks to do all the work while they enjoyed the blessings of leisure. Well, oftentimes, we as, as bad as that worldview sounds to us today, it is kind of the worldview we walk around in. We kind of think, you know, if I really had it made, I wouldn't have to work. I would, I would just live a life of constant leisure. But really, as you shift into uh, many of the world religions, and I'm not going to go over each one there, but you can look and see that work uh, is a sacred thing. There is a sacredness to work. In fact, I've titled this our sacred vocation. I use that word intentionally uh, because as someone who is a clergy member, I have people come up to me all the time and say, boy, I wish I had meaningful work like what you do. I'm sure your work is very meaningful. Mine is just that all I do is X, but you get to do Y, right? And, and this division is created that somehow there's sacred work and then there's just regular work or secular work. And we have created this division and I just think it's a bad division. Uh, usually when someone says that, I've just spent hours you know, approving time cards, working on schedules, uh, getting, you know, all kinds of buttons clicked in my job. And I'm thinking, you know, I don't do much different than what you do, right? I mean, there's still a lot of tasks, work tasks to be done in order to do what we do. And so uh, I, I, I really resist this, this uh, division between sacred work and just every other kind of work. I think all work is sacred. It is why I titled it the way I did. Uh, I don't think it's just being a doctor or being a nurse is a you know, sacred work or being a chaplain and everything else just supports that. Now, every part of what we do is working toward the larger, grander goal and brings great sense of meaning and purpose to what we do. So I would encourage you to begin thinking about the sacredness of your job, no matter what your job is. And so with that, that leads me to story number two. And this is the one where I, I, I warned you, I'm going to talk a little bit about my uh, mental health challenges that my father experienced that really were uh, an influence to me and to my family. I, I'll never forget, I was standing um, in a store somewhere. I don't, I don't remember exactly the store. It might have been a Ross or something like that. Um, I don't even exactly remember the year, but I remember vividly, you know, when, when something happens that brands and memory. I, I have a branded memory of standing in, in a, among um, Halloween costumes. My wife and my children were picking out, my kids were really young, picking out Halloween costumes. I just remember that vividly when my phone rang and it was my mother. And she was telling me that my father, who was a, a, a mailman, he'd been a mailman for like almost 30 years one of the happiest people you'll ever meet. In fact, he reminds, uh, I'm sort of a spitting image of my father. If I post a picture on Facebook, somebody will say, oh my gosh, you look just like your father. I have, I have a similar personality. I have a similar um, love for humor. I have a similar people pleasing problem. Uh, we had the same problems too. Um, so I'm a lot like my father. So it was really shock, shocking to hear my mother say that he had walked off his job that Saturday morning without telling anyone which is something my father never did. He never missed work. He walked off the job and went home and took some medications and attempted to overdose and ended up in the, in the emergency department and in the hospital. For the next two weeks, he ended up in a psych hospital and I flew out to Dallas where my family lives. And I went straight to, to the hospital, went straight to his room. And I, was, I saw a man that was almost unrecognizable. He was just in a very, very, very dark, dark space. Could, could barely even look up to even acknowledge I was present. And he was asking me really deep questions, like how come he couldn't experience God? He, he, he just 
completely felt devoid of, of feeling and emotion. And I, I didn't know what to say. And I was an ordained minister. And here I was having awkward conversations with my father. After that, I, we went back to my house and I was, or my mom's house. And I was talking to my mom. I said, mom, what, what, what happened? What, what happened? And she said, David, I think your dad has always had an underlying depression that he's just never acknowledged. I said, well, where do you think that comes from? She said, I think it comes from the fact that years ago when he left the military, he was fortunate during Vietnam to go to Germany and not Vietnam. He came back from Germany. Um, he needed some work. He had, he had been working his way through seminary. He was going to become a minister, just like I became. That was his goal. And he had finished about two thirds worth of work uh, of that program when he got called to the military. He came back and he wanted to finish school, but he didn't have any money. So he went to the post office. They gave him all these extra points for being uh, a, a military veteran. And he um, he started working the post office and a year went by, two years went by, three years went by, and there became no point in his mind of going. He, he just couldn't, couldn't fulfill the dream he wanted. And so for 30 years, he worked at the post office and she said he always lived with regret that he didn't early on follow the dream of what he felt called to do with his life. Now, this was really troubling for me because my father was a hero to me. My father was, I, I thought it was so cool as a little kid that my father was a mailman. Uh, he was the most beloved mailman in town. Like he, he, everybody knew him at the Whataburger. If you've ever eaten at the Whataburger, you know what I'm talking about. He would eat there every day for lunch. Everybody in the Whataburger knew who my father was. Uh, he was... At the, at the company parties, he was always telling the stories. Uh, he would work in, uh, he worked in our church on the weekends. He would, he was a leader in our church, seemed very fulfilled to me. Um, and then he had the opportunity to, or through his hard work, gave me the opportunity to go and get a college education and go on to seminary and to become what I thought I needed to be. And that is a, a minister myself. And I just, I, I remember feeling very, very angry at my father because I, I didn't know why he didn't embrace the meaning and purpose of his life. And I didn't quite under, it took me years to kind of begin to understand why my father would feel the way he felt. And, and when I think about my father, I, I, I feel very burdened and I feel sad over the fact that uh, there was an opportunity uh, that for him to live a fulfilling life that he feel like he felt like he missed that there wasn't an opportunity for someone to tell, help him to see just what great meaning his actual work brought to his life. He couldn't find it. And so it led to him to a deep, dark place, which has always led me to think about what the, the importance of finding meaning in our work. Um, I think it's always important that if you're feeling at all like my father did, you're feeling like, man, I, I, I missed my opportunity and, and I'm feeling a sense of despair right? Get help. I don't know that he had a lot of help uh, and resources back then, uh, but but we have them today, and I hope that you'll reach out to them. But I tell the story about my father, because what I learned from that is the purpose of work is inseparable from the purpose of life. If we're going to spend 100,000 hours doing something we call work, we can't we can't compartmentalize that. My father was not able to compartmentalize work. I think that's what he was trying to do. He's like, well, I do this so I can do all these other things. And he rationalized that for a long time and then and developed a sense that what he was doing every day didn't have meaning and didn't have purpose. And I, and I, I was sad for him. That In fact, that began, uh, I think, a, a, a decline for him that uh, where a few years later he, he passed away in, in, in an ICU uh, after an infection that I think he would have had the strength to fight had he not uh, had this overwhelming sense uh, of depression that lived with him for quite a while. So I sort of lost my father to this, what I sense was a lack of sense of purpose that he felt. And, and I want to—I I don't have a solution for it except to say that I, I, I recognize that if you want to have a sense of purpose in your life, you also have to sense have a sense of purpose in your work. So to do that, it might be worth setting aside work talk for a minute and actually talking about how we pursue meaning in our lives. 
the fact is we're all on a pursuit of meaning. Uh, we pursue that with, uh, with, with vigor. Um, I would imagine, I think I see 167 participants on this call. If, if you didn't have some sense of purpose, I don't think you would be here listening for something that might improve the way you, you work or improve the way you live. So I, I would assume all 167 of you have some sense of meaning and purpose in your life. And you wouldn't be here doing this if you weren't pursuing that. That's the life that we all live. We're always in pursuit of a life that matters. And then everything that we do in our life, we know impacts who we are as a person and it impacts uh, other people around us. And that is really at the core of what meaning is about. We're constantly forming ourselves and we're constantly influencing others. And that dynamic of growth, personal development, and impact on others is what causes us to feel a sense of meaning and purpose. And then I uh, have to, to raise these four qualities that actually we talked about in the beginning. And that is um, we crave in, in developing meaning in our lives, a sense of identity. And, you know, I, we build our lives around building identity. You know, I am son, I am father, I am husband. I am chaplain, I am reverend, I am Dave, I am friend. You know, we, we, we spend our lives building these titles of identity that chisel away at who we are, that shape us, that give us a certain character. And that becomes a, a strong, strong, strong source of meaning for us. And then that connects into our relationships, connects into a sense of purpose, it connects into a sense of power. And we're seeking all of that and it would be difficult to look at that list and not see work playing a big part. Um, it can be said a different way, and I'll go through these quickly. Um, pillars of a meaningful life, a sense of belonging. Uh, I, I, I often hear people that have the most meaningful work, they're not talking necessarily about what they do, but who they are connected to in their work. Right? That sense of belonging is high in, in our work environment. A uh, sense of purpose. Uh, I think we're all a part of a grand purpose of healthcare here, and I think uh, I think the higher we understand, the, the better we understand it, the higher sense of meaning uh, we can feel in what we do. Storytelling. So we're always telling a story about our lives and about our work. Um, last year, what I did uh, the lunch and learn is about stories we tell ourselves. I'm a big advocate for us understanding the stories we create. My father created a very dark story for himself. And I, 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 I'm sad he didn't write a different story and what didn't feel empowered to write that story. Um, and then of course, the sense of transcendence that something we're doing is bigger than us, right? And I think our work can contribute to all of those. So I, I, would, I would guide you to this thought right here. Ultimately, if you're not happy with who you are, you'll never be happy with what you do. Right, and so much of what we do shapes who we are, right? So these are, you know, our work and our sense of identity and, and who we are as a person really are intertwined. We really can't compartmentalize our work life away from the rest of our life. Uh, we, uh, that's not a healthy thing to do, but to find it a way to integrate it. What I do is connected to who I am as a person. Who I am as a person shapes what it is that I do. Um, it, it's really vital to think about meaning this way in the, in the sense of there's, there's our doing and then there's our being. Um, and most important is to have that sense of who you are as a person. Because as time goes by, and this is what retirement, as I mentioned at the beginning, is about, is you're going to be able to do less. Like there's, there comes a point where you're less able to do and you're going to have to lean more into, into the being, being overdoing. And I think being and doing are highly connected during our work lives. And if there's not an integrated sense of that, then there could be a time in which we struggle with who we are when, when work is no longer an active part of our lives, who we are left when, when all of that environment is taken away. So I would encourage you not to separate out doing versus being. These are very much connected. 
work drives meaning, meaning shapes our work. And with that, I go to story time of day part three. This one is, is a story about my, my own crisis with work. Um, about the time my father had that incident, it was a few years after that, um, I was a young minister. I was about 10 years into my pastorate, and I already knew from some doctoral work that I was working on at the time. I was studying pastoral burnout, ironically, and found out that around year 10, pastors typically have a crisis point where they recognize that what they did for the first 10 years they, is unsustainable over the next 30. So you burn yourself out in those first 10 years and, and then reach this point where you say, okay, well, I can't live the next 30 the way I just did these first 10. And I was at that point. I was at a very high stress point. I was a pastor of a fairly large church for being a young pastor like I was. We ran about four or 500 on a Sunday morning. That was a fairly large church. I've had people reminding me all the time, I was very lucky to be 30 years old pastoring a large congregation because many people in their 50s and 60s would never get to pastor a large congregation. But I, I felt a lot of meaning and a lot of sense of value in the fact that I pastored a big church. Well, I was getting exhausted from that. And so I put out my resume and uh, I was talking to another church up in New Jersey. And the, um, this church was double the size of my church. They ran between eight and 1200 on a Sunday morning. And I thought, see, that I, you, know, you can see the trajectory of my career moving. This is how it was supposed to go. I didn't imagine it any other way. I felt a great sense of meaning and purpose in moving forward in my career the way I was. I loved the ministry. I loved what I was doing. And I, and, uh, at one point, this is an interesting part of the story, my, my current congregation I was in, the, the web designer for my realtor found out that I was secretly putting my house on the market in preparation for a move. And that word got all over the church and everyone knew I was leaving. That made it really hard to stay. And I thought, well, that's no big deal because this, this uh, church that I was going to go to, it was pretty much done deal. So I actually sold my house, uh, packed everything up, moved it to a storage facility in New Jersey. That's how confident I was that this was going to work out. And, and if, you, if you don't hear the theme developing, I think it's called don't count your chickens before they're hatched, right? Uh, big life lesson to learn, by the way. But that's what I did. And it turned out to be a big mistake. I was standing in my mother-in-law's basement one day when I got a call. I was on that last weekend. I had just come back from that weekend, ready to be the new pastor of this church. When I got the call that um, early on in my questionnaire, I was, I was a different brand of denomination than this church was. And they had asked me my beliefs about something. And I said they were X, Y, and Z. And then there was a question about whether that really matched with the church. And well, anyway, they discovered that in their bylaws, they were not allowed to call a pastor that didn't 100% agree with their belief system. And mine wasn't exactly 100% aligned. And to my shock, they, they shared with me that they would be ending their relationship with me and uh, they would be looking elsewhere. And so after nine months of preparing for this transition, I get to the very last minute. I'm standing in my mother-in-law's basement. My stuff's in New Jersey in a storage shed. My uh, kids are pitter-patter of their little feet running overhead. I'll never forget that noise and that sound. And then suddenly realizing I was jobless and homeless. And um, it was a scary, scary time to lose the pathway of your career. Um, at that time, you know, pastors who had jobs, it was easy to get jobs. Pastors that didn't have jobs, it was hard to get anyone to look at you for, for a serious interview. So I knew what was happening to my life. So at that point, we threw a, a dart at the map and hit Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, I liked it because it was an hour away from my in-laws. That was important. And so we moved to um, Harrisburg, and I didn't know what we would do here. Well, we invested some of our money in a business, and my wife ran that business for a couple of years while I went and tried to find a job. I needed work. And I've learned very quickly that a master's of divinity is worth about $12.50 an hour on the street, which is not a lot. And so I went, I had my uh, 
church bus license, and that got that was enough to get me a, a, a truck driving job in the local area. And I went and I thought, well, I'll do that for a couple of months until another job unfolds. And the the other jobs never unfolded. So I I worked for a month in that job. I worked for two months in that job. I worked for six months in that job. Then I was a year in that job. And all of a sudden, I just lost my sense of identity, lost my sense of purpose. Who am I? Uh, what is my identity? Am I a pastor? Am I not a pastor anymore? And I really went through a, an early midlife crisis. In fact, I'll show you a picture. That's me in the truck. Uh, it's the only picture I can find of me back in this era, but I found it the other day. But that was me. Uh, and I remember I would get up uh, and go all across Pennsylvania and make these deliveries. And I, it was a very different plan from what I had for my life. And, and, and let me say this, um, you know, some people have said, well, are, are you saying that truck driving is not a meaningful? Actually, I love this job. It was a great job. I loved it. I, I loved that I, when I went home at night, I didn't think at all about my job. I've never had a job where I could do that. I listened to probably a hundred books on tape. I was processing all of my grief and trauma. I was able to spend time with my family uh, in ways I hadn't before. It was a very good part of my, my life, but, it, but I was really struggling because I, I began to feel what my father was feeling. You know, that question of, I was thinking about my father, like, is this what I really should do with my life? At what point do I take a risk? And I remember I was with uh, a colleague, um, his name is Bo. I, I, every once in a while, I run into Bo here in the hospital. It's great to reconnect with somebody from that chapter of my life. And he, he knew one day I would, be, I would be in a place like this. Um, but I remember Bo was telling me, you know, he used to be a, he used to be an accountant and he got burned out on being an accountant. He took this truck driving job because he absolutely loved it and he would never look back. And, and I remember we were, we were talking one day and, uh, and, and I remember him saying, so Dave, you gotta be careful because when you, how far are you from two years? I said, well, I'm a few months away from it in two years. Oh, when you hit two years, you're going to get vested. And once you're vested, you're sucked in for life. You're never leaving. He goes, all these guys you see over here, they got vested. They weren't going to stay here, but they got vested. All of a sudden, I became frightened to death of getting vested, right? And I remember a week before my two-year anniversary, walking in and resigning in faith, in fear. And, and at the time, I, I, I was invited by this small little bitty church in Harrisburg to come pastor. So I went from the possibility of pastoring an 800-member church to uh, about 45, 50 people. And I was pastoring them part-time. They could barely hold on to me. But they said, David, if you want to quit that job and you want to really re-pursue your career in ministry again, we'll support you. And they did. It was a very scary time of stepping out. In, in fear and in faith all at the same time. And I remember doing that. Um, and it was a few years later after pastoring that church for a little while that someone said to me in my church, you know, David, I, you, should, you should be a chaplain. I was like, I don't even know what a chaplain is. Said, oh, well, you, should, you should go train to be a chaplain. I said, well, where do you do that? They were like, well, I think Hershey Medical Center has a program. So I emailed Hershey Medical Center, emailed Pr Priscilla Denham, who was the director at the time, uh, and she invited me to meet with her. And ironically, I sat right over there in this chair. I came right into this office and I sat over there thir 13 years ago. And I asked her, what is a chaplain and how do I become one? And then right out of that, uh, after that conversation, she accepted me into the residency program. I became a chaplain resident here. Uh, we work our chaplain residents very, very hard. And I, re I remember at the end of that residency, um, I had lost 40 pounds. I was in the best psychological shape of my life. I was full of vigor and meaning and purpose after doing that residency. And I remember the director telling me, you know, nobody's ever come through this program healthier than they went when they started, but you seem to defy the odds. And I said, well, that's the power of finally getting to re-embrace what you feel called to do. I tell that story because I think at some point, every single one of us have to take ownership of our work and realize that finding meaning in our work 
is an intentional practice. Sometimes we actually have to step out and take risks. Sometimes we have to do things that make us feel uncomfortable. Um, for some of you, it is, um, it is finding the meaning that's in your work that you haven't owned and claimed. But for others of you, you've had your, you've had your finger on the, uh, the catalog you know, at, at Penn State University, and you've been thinking about going back to school and retooling yourself for, for a different direction in your life. Maybe this is the time to do that. Maybe this is the time where you can begin to take agency over your work life and begin to shape uh, your work to bring you a greater sense of meaning for your, your life as you move forward. It could be a long journey. For me, it was a very long journey of transition to one day get to sit and be the director of pastoral care in a place that, that really formed me and shaped me that real sense of meaning and purpose that I get from that. But I encourage you not to be passive or to feel like you have no control over that sense of purpose in your work life. I think we have far more agency than we realize. Uh, I also say this to you, if you are a leader, is um, you have a great responsibility as a leader that you have influence over the sense of purpose and meaning people have in their work life. If you're a tough person to work for and you're a micromanager and you sap out every piece of joy that you can find in your department because you want people to produce a certain way, then you're going to find that people are very miserable. Your workforce is miserable. And there's there should be a sense of obligation uh, among leadership that you know, we, we are stewards of other people's meaning and purpose in what they find in their work. I think the most important thing I can do as a leader um, is, is pave the pathway for my staff to be everything they want to be in their life, to, be, to live their life to the fullest, to live their work life to the fullest, um, so that they can together achieve something that will bring great meaning to them. And for me, just to be a micromanager or be a hard boss to work for, uh, I, I think I think we have to take ownership of the responsibility we have as leaders in helping to create a meaningful work environment for those we work with. I would also say to all of us that when we think of our employee engagement scores, you know, what's the mystery of getting those scores up? Then um, it really is about a culture. It is really about a culture. If every single one of us, instead of always focusing on the things we don't like about our job, which is not hard to do, right? We begin to think about the parts of our life that actually has meaning that we have just not really grasped onto, that we won't appreciate until one day we're no longer employed or working in this job. I don't want any of us to not to, to wait until we're out of this work to begin to really appreciate this work. I want us to appreciate it now, which is why I leave you with these practical thoughts before we leave, is what does it mean to practice workplace mindfulness? Here's what I mean by that. To be mindful about all the areas of joy and fulfillment that you get from your work that maybe you haven't noticed or seen. One example of that is um, Mary Lou Kanaski. She's a nurse that was here for many years, and she retired a little over a year ago. I remember seeing her six months ago after watching that video, and I said, hey, how has retirement been for you? I hear it can be quite an adjustment. I was very curious to hear what she would say. And she looked me straight in the eye, and she said, David, do not take for granted the joy and the meaning you get from merely walking down the hall of that hospital and getting to see and greet and make eye contact with your coworkers. Because one day, David, you will not get to do that. And you have no idea how much meaning and fulfillment that simple walk down the hall means to you until you no longer have it. And after she told me that, I began to practice hallway mindfulness. Yeah, it's hard not to look at your phone. It's hard not to just be thinking of your mind in, other, in a million other places, but I'll walk down the hall of this hospital and I'd love to walk down the hall of this hospital. I'd love to see the faces of the people I work with and give thanks to God that I get to do that today, that I get to connect with some wonderful people in my workplace. I don't know that I ever appreciated that until Mary Lou said that to me. That's 
workplace mindfulness to be able to really look with fresh eyes at the at the work you get to do. For me, it comes from the fact that um, that is Tuesday. Tuesdays were always big in my work life. Tuesdays used to be my sermon prep day way back in the day. I would go and sit in the corner of a coffee shop and I would block my calendar and I would just read and reflect and meditate. I love that. But back when I was driving that truck, Tuesday was my darkest day. I literally, I got up at three in the morning, got in my truck, drove down to Washington, D.C. to try to beat traffic. And then I fought traffic all day long, would come back 15, 16 hours later, completely exhausted. And every Tuesday, I have a ritual where I get up every Tuesday, I acknowledge that it's Tuesday and that I get to do what I get to do. I was nervous as heck all morning, honestly, that I was going to have to present this presentation to you. But I was also very, very grateful that I got to get up this morning and look forward to this moment of being with you. And that's workplace mindfulness. So with that, take joy in the people you get to work alongside. And do you take other people for granted that you get to share in this work with? What is the, mi the mission you're, that we're doing here? We, we are a part of a grand mission called healthcare. And healthcare needs all hands on deck to make it work. We can't even see uh, six months around the corner most times in healthcare. It's a, it's a mystery. It's coming at us fast. It's very challenging. We're dealing with lots of pressures, but it is, at the end of the day, very meaningful work. And then embracing work more as, uh, as more than a paid job you have to do, right? Um, I think of my photography. I, I love photography. I actually wrote a business plan once to be a paid photographer and do weddings. And by the time I was done, I realized that if I did it to make a living, it would sap the joy out of it for me. So I'm a hardworking photographer for free. I just did a friend's wedding uh, for a deep discount last week because I, that, I don't want to get, I don't want to make a living doing that. I want to love what I do uh, with that in photography and other hobbies can be that outlet for us, gardening or home repairs or doing the things that you do that's part of your work life. It, you're not getting paid for it, but it's a whole package of what brings you meaning to your life. And then finally, stay clear on the impact you have on others because you do have an impact on others. When you say hi to them walking down the hall, when you work together with them on a project, you're influencing other people. When you care for a patient, when you care for their family, when you, when you talk to a colleague, when you contribute in staff meetings, all of those are having an impact. And to have a mindfulness about that impact will bring you a greater sense of, of meaning. And then finally, maybe somebody here needs to make a course correction. Maybe you're like I was in, in that truck realizing, oh my goodness, I'm going to be vested in a couple of weeks. I don't, you know, I could hear my father saying, Dave, don't do it. You have an opportunity. Take the chance, take the risk. And I took the risk and I'm grateful for it, but it was a scary risk. And maybe some of you, there's intentional plans that you need to make that would enrich your work life, enrich your career so that your career will make a greater impact on the meaning that you have for your life. And with that, one last slide. I'm going to close with this. This is a beautiful poem by Khalil Gibran. He's a, a Lebanese poet and philosopher. And um, he, he pretty much wrote about everything. So if you, if you have a topic, you just type his name in the topic. And he probably has written something pretty profound about it. And so I just share that with you. And, and so just maybe close your eyes and listen to these words. Always you have been told that work is a curse and labor a misfortune. But I say to you that when you work, you fulfill a part of Earth's furthest dream, assigned to you when the dream was born. And in keeping yourself with labor, you are in truth loving life. And to love life through labor is to be intimate with life's most intimate secret. You have been told also that life is darkness. And in your weariness, you echo that was said by the weary. And I say that life is indeed darkness, save when there is urge. And all urge is blind, save when there is knowledge. And all knowledge is vain, save when there is work. And all work is empty, save when there is love. And when you work 
with love, you bind yourself to yourself and to one another and to God. Amen. And with that, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I will turn it back over. And if we have any comments or questions, I'm glad, glad to reflect on that. Hey, right. thank you so much, David. That was such a wonderful presentation. And thank you so much for sharing your personal story. It's very touching. Um, if there's any questions or comments here for David, again, feel free to use the Q&A or the chat box and we'll um, get to them. I see someone just thanking you for your story. But anything else? David, I know you said you were nervous, but you did a great job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Couldn't tell that you're nervous. All right. Any other questions or comments? Just some more. Thank you. Great presentation. All right. Well, if there's no immediate questions, um, again, we will be sending out the recording along with uh, the copy of the slides. Um, so expect, expect that within the next few days. Um, we'll also have our July's uh, session advertised in there as well. So if there's no final questions, which I don't see, I just want to thank you again, David, and thank you for everyone who joined us. We will see you next time.